Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Anna, and I'm with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center. Today, we have Kathy Tardy joining us, who is a certified SCORE mentor, is a CPA, and holds an MBA in tax accounting, and has been the president of her accounting firm for 31 years. Kathy will be presenting Tax Strategies, Keeping Your Profits in Your Pocket. We will be using the Q&A function to take questions and welcome attendee participation. So don't hesitate to ask us any questions you may have. Definitely don't be shy. We'll answer questions during and at the end of the webinar. And then the following slide features some COVID-19 business resource links, which I won't go over in detail as we'll send you a copy of the presentation at the end of the webinar. And then lastly, please visit our website at nmsbdc.org to view our upcoming no-cost webinars or to sign up for our no-cost counseling services. I'll also send a follow-up email to you with this information. Thanks so much for joining us. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Kathy. Thank you. So today we're gonna to be talking about how to keep your profits in your pockets. And just a quick outline of the 10 points we're gonna cover not all the um, possibilities in tax planning, of course, but things that we should be aware of. So when you're talking about tax planning, where does it really start? And really, it starts with considering the economy. As you know, there's been a lot of uh, switch up in what's happening in our economy. Gas prices are up. We've got supply chain issues. A lot of different things are happening. Uh, taxes, the uh, President Biden presented a packet to raise taxes on Monday. Uh, so lots of things are going on. But when we're doing, trying to plan for our taxes, we want to look at and consider the following. So what is your line of business? How do the things that are happening in the economy affect your type of business? And what recent events have caused your business to grow or decline. And also when we're talking about just our business, we have to look at related businesses, which may be part of the supply chain issue and looking at inflation indications. Well, we don't need just inflation indications. We have full, full on inflation right now. So we're all seeing the increases in, in everything from food to, to gas, to clothing, et cetera. But one of the good places to help you identify things that are happening in the economy that might be affecting your personal industry is to look at your industry groups because they, also, they often will have some kind of economic forecast for the next year or maybe even farther out into the future. So when we're looking at planning for our businesses, we need to look at our projections. And so we need to actually project our year-end business income or loss. And I have clients all the time say, well, I, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know how to do that. Well, if you don't plan, you're not gonna succeed. So if you're planning, I, I'm gonna make another million dollars this year, you need to have a plan on how you're actually going to achieve that and get into specifics. And so some of the things that you might wanna consider in your year-end business planning is to analyze your cash position. So if your cash is flowing really well and you have cash that you could use to invest in your company, that's excellent. But if your cash flow is not flowing, maybe your accounts receivables are getting larger and larger and people aren't paying, we need to figure out ways to make your cash position be stronger. And some of the things that you may consider are getting a credit line, from your banker, and also maybe the availability of some short-term advances on credit cards, which I hate to recommend because generally the interest rates are sky high, but sometimes to uh, meet a short-term short cash uh, flow situation, we can utilize that. So be aware of uh, any credit card balance uh, opportunities you have and also getting a line of credit if you don't already have one from your bank. Along with the business situation, 
We also have to consider our personal tax situation. And the reason I say this is because generally most of our small businesses these days are some kind of pass through entity, be it an S corporation or a limited liability company. And so, and maybe even a single member LLC. So when you're thinking about taxes, not only do you have to consider taxes for your business, but you have to consider the tax situation that you have personally, maybe you're married, maybe you have children. And so these factors are all going to impact your tax situation and you need to take it into account. So um, uh, personal tax situation, your personal income, maybe your spouse has a W-2 and is earning income, or maybe they have another business as well. And personal expenses. Well, some personal expenses are tax deductibles and other aren't. And then, of course, cash needs on your personal side as well. Are we uh, needing money for the kids' college or uh, is a medical procedure coming up? So cash flow is important, not just for your business side, but for your personal side as well. So we're here today to talk about keeping your profits in your pocket, keeping it away from the IRS. So one of the first things we want to look at that definitely impacts our individual situation is our filing status. So as you're aware, you could file as single or married filing jointly. You can also file as married separate. And there's also a special head of household status that you may uh, be eligible for. And oftentimes, single individuals don't consider they may be eligible for head of household if they provide over half the cost of a home for a qualifying person. And it can get you a better, uh, lower tax rate and some uh, special other rules that are eligible. Generally, married separate in a community property state such as New Mexico doesn't really achieve you any tax uh, benefits, but sometimes we file marriage separate for other reasons. So your filing status is your status as of the last day of the year. So if you were married for most of the year and got divorced on December 30th, you would be considered, because on December 31st you were single, you would be considered single. Now there may be some community property split that you have to take into account. Um, but also separate property, which New Mexico does recognize. So there's some complications if you're divorced by the end of the year. Maybe you had a birth of a child, so you may be eligible for some additional uh, child tax credits. Or maybe even your elderly parent has moved in with you and now you can claim had a household because you have your parent living with you and maybe even get a other dependent credit for that. So lots of things to consider. It's not just as straightforward as we might think on first glance. So who is a dependent? That seems like a really easy question. You have someone living with you and you're paying for everything or most of everything. But there's actually, um, they changed the rules, I want to say about five or six years ago. And so now there's something called a qualifying child and also a qualifying relative. So to meet either one of those tests, they both have to file either single, married separate, or they can file jointly, but only to get uh, a withheld income taxes back. So those are sort of special circumstances. So generally, they must not be filing a joint return. They must be a citizen for at least part of the year or a US national resident alien, Canadian or Mexican resident and you have to provide at least half of their support. So a qualifying child can be son, daughter, stepchild, foster child, adopted child, direct descendant, brother, sister. I mean, it really is very inclusive. And the individual must be under 19 or under 24 and a full-time student unless they're uh, fully and totally disabled and they must have lived with the taxpayer for more than half the year unless they have an exemption. Uh, education, you know, college kids are considered as living at home even if they're gone for 12 months for the year as long as they qualify as a dependent.
Now here's the qualifying relative. It could actually be all of the same people, but there's a little bit of a difference here because they don't qualify for uh, perhaps they're um, maybe 25 years old and they're not a student. So the main differentiator is that they must have earned less than $4,300. Actually, that should say 2022. 20, Sorry, Anna, I, I missed the slide. Um, 4,300, 2022. So that number gets indexed every year. And so um, that's generally where you'll find if you have an older child that maybe has graduated from college, but they're at home, they haven't been able to find work, and they're living with you and you're paying for everything, as long as their earnings are under the 4,300, you can still claim them. Or maybe this might apply to maybe your, your mother or father or in-laws. So it's really um, a nice addition to who you can claim other than children generally. Now with the child or other dependent, there's available tax credits and children 17 and under qualify if they are um, your dependent for six months or more, U.S. citizen, all the usual uh, rules. And the tax credit is 2,000 per child and 5,000 for other dependent credit. So this was a new addition a few years back to the tax code. And is a change again from 2021 where there was the advanced child tax credits and payments were being sent everything basically went back to the pre-COVID rules. <coughs> Pardon me. So this is the child tax credit, other dependent credit, as you may remember it. There are some phase outs for modified adjusted gross income, 400,000 married filing joint, 200,000 for any other filing status. Um, okay. So Besides dependents and child tax credits and other dependent credits, something else to consider is retirement plans. Now, some retirement plans create tax deductions and some do not. So let's talk a little bit about retirement plans and what's available. So if we want to maximize contributions, we want to look at a 401k or a solo 401k. A solo 401k is basically the regular 401k but for a single member LLC or maybe a single member um, S corporation. So a business owner who is just the only employee of that business. There's also something called an SEP, which is called, really called a Simplified Employee Pension Plan. There's a simple IRA and a Roth IRA. Simple IRA is, again, an employer plan. They all have um, maximum contributions that can be made. And a Roth IRA is one where you do not get a tax deduction when you put money in, but the earnings grow tax-free. So generally, you must establish the plan before a year end, but there are some exceptions. And of course, the earlier you make contributions to your retirement funds, the faster they can grow. We know about compounding, even if it's just in something simple that is earning interest. So the dates for contributions or setting up, excuse me, setting up your retirement plans. The Safe Harbor 401k must be set up by October 1st but you can make contributions up to the filing date for the tax return that's associated with the 401k. So for example, for the S Corp, you can make a uh, request for extension and have up to September 15th of the subsequent year to make contributions. And sometimes we do that because we our cash flow is tight at year end and so we we make a decision to make that contribution. We, we don't actually make it until the subsequent year. The solo 401k must be established by December 31st. And again, contributions must be made by the due date of the business tax return that is associated with it. Roth and 
Regular IRAs must be made by April 15th. There's no extension for that. The SEP can be set up and contributions can be made up until the time of filing the business tax return. So this one gives us additional time to actually set up the plan. And a simple must be set up by October 1st. It says of the next year for the business without other simple plans or Gen 1 if they already have a simple plan. And that's sort of complicated by if you're switching plans because you may only have one type of retirement plan per year. So there's some specific rules that relate to that. And jumping back for one second, you know, I'm talking about maybe October 1st and December 31st, but you have to remember that you've got to talk to the providers of these plans and make sure that you give them time to actually get some of these things set up and you have to make some decisions about how your plans may operate. So please don't wait till the very end of the year. Start thinking about it beginning of September and start in no later than I say the 25th of September to make sure you have plenty of time to get the plan in place that you want and you have um, the ability to make some decisions about how it's going to operate. The Maximum contributions that can be made to a 401k are $67,500, which includes the deferral portion for the employee, which is $20,500 plus an additional $6,500 if the individual is over 50, plus then the employer can contribute up to 25% of uh, the employee, uh, excuse me, the deferrals up to 100% of compensation. But so the overall limit is $67,500. So that really gives you quite a bit of um, employer contribution, which is also a deduction for the employer's business. Now the solo 401k again has the same maximum contribution and the same employee deferrals. Roth and regular IRA, the limitation is $6,000. Or if you're 50 or older, you can add an additional thousand for um, $7,000 to be the maximum. The simplified employee pension plan, you can contribute up to 20% if you're self-employed or 25% of your earnings on your W-2 if you actually get a W-2 from your company. And the simple plan, you can defer uh, 14,000 plus another 3,000 if you're 50 and over, or a maximum of 100% of your compensation. Uh, so switching to one of my other favorite ways to uh, keep some profits in my pockets is to consider a Section 179 special expensing uh, deduction. So this is an election that you make to, instead of capitalizing an asset and depreciating it over the lifetime dictated by IRS, you can say, hey, IRS, I'm just going to deduct it all this year. And so in 2022, you can deduct up to a million and eighty thousand dollars in 179 purchases. And there's a, a phase out of the deduction you're allowed if you purchase over two million seven hundred thousand dollars in new assets. So one of the things I like to say about Section 179 is it's really great, especially for something that you purchase in December, but you actually have to place it in service by December 31st. I had a client um, this year who purchased about 15,000 in computer equipment, but couldn't get it placed in service. So we'll be taking that deduction next year. They also changed the tax laws to allow rental property to get the special 179 expensing election. But some of the things that go back to projecting and cash flow 
and deciding what is important for your business, I say, let's consider that you actually need the asset. Sometimes people are so focused on reducing their tax bill to zero. Maybe they purchase a um, special purpose uh, vehicle that's quite expensive and maybe they don't really need it. So I always say, let's think about whether we need it as well. And then, of course, too, when we're talking about purchasing a lot of things in December, we need to look at our cash flows and also finance, financing options. Now, we are allowed, if we do purchase a big ticket item and we don't fully pay for it, either on a credit card or by writing a check, we can still elect Section 179 on that, even if we go to the bank and finance it with the bank. So that's another tax planning opportunity that we want to keep in mind. Now, we used to have bonus depreciation years and years ago, and we kind of get it and, and, and it, um, then we don't have it and comes back and then we change it, sort of like all the rest of our tax laws, I guess, now that I'm thinking about it. But what bonus depreciation is, is the IRS has said, through 2022, so this is the last year, you can take bonus depreciation of 100%. So you're thinking, huh, well, we just talked about 179, that's 100%. Bonus depreciation is 100%. Why would we care? <laughs> but there are slight differences and different things that happen if we dispose of the asset. So we want to make sure we're clear about which of these, sorry, Which of these um, bonus depreciation or Section 179 makes the most sense for us? As you can see from the chart, in 2023, bonus is going to go down to 80%, then 60%, 40%, 20%, 2027. But, I mean, really, who knows? <laughs> they change the tax laws all the time. So as of today, that's how the bonus depreciation works. And it also has implications when we talk about vehicles, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And you can take Section 179 and bonus depreciation. So sometimes there's reasons to do so. So we're talking about trying to keep our profits in our, t in our pockets. And so the way that we're trying to do that is by focusing on tax issues. So when we're talking about taxes, we need to look into the future, too, to decide, are tax rates increasing? Well, based on everything I've read, and I'm sure you've seen in the news as well, they're talking about increasing tax rates. The corporate tax rate going from 21 to 28 percent is back on the table. They're also talking about taxing unrealized gains. They were talking about taxing capital gains at a higher rate. So all these different things, we certainly expect our income tax rates are going to be going up, as well as just the rates in the different brackets themselves. So if tax rates are increasing, you know, what can we do? What makes the most sense? Well, maybe we need to defer some deductions into next year because we think they'll be more valuable next year. So maybe instead of buying that equipment, in December, maybe we wait till January because we really are going to need it more. We may, you know, jump a bracket from 21 to 28 percent if we're corporate, so we could save, you know, seven percent right there. So uh, something that's much talked about in the news is this state and local tax being limited to ten thousand dollars, and you know, people in high uh, income tax states really were up in arms. And it's still talked about as maybe that will be repealed, but I haven't, there's nothing concrete on the book. So your state and local income taxes and property taxes combined are limited to $10,000, which is not a lot. But sometimes we may say, well, the tax rates are going to go up. Maybe we want to defer that last half of our property taxes and pay it in 2023 to kind of group our deductions more in 2023 than in 2022. Another thing an employer could do to uh, consider if tax rates are increasing is maybe hold the employee bonus instead of 
you know, December 1st until January 1st, again, to push that deduction into the subsequent year. Same thing might uh, cross our minds when we're talking about charitable contributions, and we might push that bigger deduction into the subsequent year, or maybe double up on charitable deductions in the subsequent year to take advantage of getting a bigger bang for our buck. And then one thing I wanted to mention that some people are not aware of is credit card deductions. IRS says as long as you charge it to your credit card by December 31st, even if you haven't paid off that credit card, you can still take that deduction in the current year. So we need to decide when we actually want to put it on our credit card, even though we know we may not pay it till January. We want to make sure we, we charge it in January if that's the month that we really would like to look at it. Now, I know you all are laughing because our tax rate's decreasing. Well, most likely not. But again, we look at very similar things and just do the opposite. So we don't prepay, we don't hold bonuses, you know, we put everything in to uh, a deduction in 2022 because 2023 is going to be a lower tax rate. So let's get the bigger benefit by pushing the deductions in the year where we can do that. Okay, so now let's switch and talk a little bit about cars, trucks, and vans. We hear all the time on the TV about, oh, you can deduct your whole vehicle, come on in and buy one before the end of the year. And that does apply to some vehicles, but not all. So uh, some things to know about cars and trucks and vans. So for mileage and um, expenses for the vehicles, it's going to 58 and a half cents for 2022. You are required to have a log date, place, and business purpose. And I really like Mile IQ, and no, I don't get a commission every time someone buys one, but it's really easy. And you just set up the app on your phone, and it, whenever you're driving, it will track and tell you mileage, and then give you the opportunity to tell it whether it's business or personal miles. So to me, that's ideal. Sometimes I tell my clients to just grab a calendar, you know, you get some free in the mail from your charitable organizations and just use that as a way to log business miles for the day. But you have some method because if you are, heaven forbid, sent the love note from IRS, you want to make sure you do have some way to prove your miles. Now, this is another issue that sometimes I find is that we need to have a place from which we leave and come back to to count our business miles and only miles from business office count so some people say well i had to drive up to santa fe because that's where my office is well no that's commuting and not deductible so once you get to santa fe if you're driving around town in santa fe those miles are deductible and the question always comes up, well, should I take actual costs or standard mileage rate? Can I change? Yes, you can switch every year, but the first year you have to use standard mileage rate, and then every year thereafter you can pick which is most beneficial. And generally I find that the standard mileage rate is more than sufficient to cover your costs but we do have rising gas prices, and if you have an older car, you may find that actual actually may be more. So I generally tell people to track them both, and then at the end of the year, we can compare and decide what makes the most sense, what's the bigger deduction for us. Now, along with the cars, trucks, and vans, we talked a little bit about depreciation 179 and bonus depreciation before, but we have special rules for these types of assets. So we can take depreciation 179 and bonus if we are using these vehicles for business purpose and we must be using them at a minimum 50%. Hopefully we're using them 100, but we can prorate, but it must be at a minimum 50%. So we have three types of vehicles, a passenger vehicle, which is generally a car, 
an SUV, and then the special vehicles that have a gross vehicle weight over 6,000 pounds. Generally, these are extended cab pickups and special use vehicles. So the passenger vehicle is limited to 18,200, which includes both the bonus depreciation amount and um, 10,200 without, so excuse me, so the 18.2 is including bonus and 179. Remember how I said you could add them? But if you just take the bonus, you're limited to $10,200. Now the SUV is eligible for 100% bonus depreciation, which the passenger vehicle is not. And the 179 is limited to $27,000. These trucks over 6,000 pounds are eligible for full 179 and 100% bonus depreciation. So you can see how as you move up, of course the cost to purchase is more, but you get to take a bigger deduction. Home office. We've heard a lot of talk about this because the tax laws, I think of the 2017 change, removed a home office deduction if you were an employee. So employees are no longer eligible to claim a home office. So you must be self-employed, um, have your own business. But home offices are still important because we need to establish our principal place of business. So to qualify for a home office, we need to have regular and exclusive use of the property and we can perform just admin or management activities there. We do not have to meet clients there. So regular and exclusive use means you're using it all the time and exclusively for business. It cannot be a guest room that you're having guests in every weekend. You can uh, portion off a part of a room. It doesn't have to be a full room. And if that's your regular exclusive use area, you can treat that as your home office. One thing to consider with a home office is that depreciation can create taxable income on the sale of your principal residence. So generally it's not a large number, but it is something to consider. And one of the things that I like to stress about a home office is, remember we need a place to leave from to do our business miles. So if we have a home office, every time we leave our home on a business purpose, we can take mileage there. So we don't have to wait to get to the office and then log mileage to the first client's office. We can log from our home office because that is our, our office. So if we don't have a business principal place of business, I've heard it being challenged that you may not be eligible for any mileage deduction whatsoever. So a home office can be very important and you may want to establish just a few feet in your home that you can claim your regular and exclusive use for to be eligible for that. There is a safe harbor, safe harbor method that you can use and you can use the square footage of your home office up to 300 square feet and just take $5 per square foot. So your maximum would be $1,500. So depending on how large your uh, home office is and maybe your utility costs and maybe some maintenance repair costs, property taxes, all of that information that you have to provide to do the actual instead of the safe harbor method, you may find that's a bigger number. So again, I say, let's track that additional information and at the end of the year, we can decide what makes more sense to take the uh, safe harbor or the actual expenses for our home office. So again, talking about what's happening in um, taxes, we talked about deductions. What about income? So if taxes are increasing, we may want to take our capital gains right now, but not our losses. They were talking about increasing capital gains rates to 25%. Um, that kind of comes on the table, off the table, so we don't know. But sometimes it makes sense to go ahead and capture some of those capital gains now 
and mindful of the wash sale rules, we may repurchase it in 31 days, but we've um, captured that unrealized gain now and, and made sure it was only taxed at 15%. We may want to encourage early payment from our customers <coughs> um, and maybe rent payments, closing. So if there's ways to accelerate income into the current year, if we know taxes are going to be more next year, let's look at that and how we can achieve that. So right now, these are the tax brackets for 2022. And again, I, as I mentioned, the tax rates for the higher income uh, earners are anticipated to go up, and that's pretty much a guarantee. But you can see for a single filer, the um, tax rates for the 10% bracket goes up to $10,275, and then for married goes to $2,550. More and more people are pushed into this 22-24% bracket, and you can see where those cut off. Now, the head of household will have a slightly different rate for single individuals up to the 22% bracket, but then they become the same as the single filers when you go over the 24% bracket. But these are the brackets to watch because not only do we have higher income tax brackets, and again, look, we're up to 37%. We also have special add-on taxes for if we have uh, large W-2s, we've got that extra little tax. Plus, we also have a tax for investment income taxes on interest and dividends, that kind of thing. So really, sometimes this can get up to as much as 40, 41, 42% with the add-ons. So right now, you can see we've got a flat rate for the corporate brackets. And I just left these in. These are the old brackets when the rates used to jump around. You may remember corporate was started at 15%, that went up to 20, that went up to like 30, 34, 39, then went back down. And so I just left the brackets, but right now it's 21%. And again, they're talking about raising the corporate rate to 28%. So, you know, are they going to get that passed and when's that going to take into effect? So in our planning, we need to consider that. So something I'd like to consider, if possible, employing our children. Um, this is a nice way to, one, have them be um, responsible and doing some work and helping you. Uh, we do want to pay them reasonable compensation, and their compensation is also eligible for IRA deductions, which is a nice way to get the kids to start saving early. And if they have no other interest in dividend income, their standard deduction, and if they're pro providing over half their support, their standard deduction is $12,950. That's $12,950 that ha help decrease your tax rate and so pushed it out of your pocket and the kids got it basically for zero tax. Um, sometimes we consider gifting income producing assets to our kids, um, but it works generally better if they're over 18 because if they're less than that and they have 2300 or more, then these kitty tax rules throw that tax back into the regular rules and you're having it taxed at your own income tax rate. So it's not achieving those tax savings that we're looking for. But I really stress when we're talking about shifting income to our children, it's reasonable for the duties that they're performing. So let's make sure that we consider that as well. Something else, this is again more on the personal side, although some companies now are doing some investing within their companies. But looking at your stock portfolio, and considering the value of your stock to your purchase price. So basically looking at unrealized gains and losses. So maybe it's time to sell some losers. And that would be great in the higher tax year. So um, 
Hello. Um, but I always say, let's talk to our advisor and think about, does it make sense to sell this? Maybe we should take some profits before the end of the year, before the rates increase. Maybe we've got some carry forwards that maybe we want to offset. So let's develop a plan and make sure that we're considering all the different options for our portfolios and just not ignoring them in the mix with capital gains and losses. We can, um, well, let me jump back for right now and talk about the rates. The current rates for capital gains are 0, 15, or 20 percent. And depending on what uh, filing status you have, you have these different brackets. And so up to 41,675 for a single individual for capital gains is taxed at zero. So again, you know, maybe if we've got a low income year, we could take advantage of actually um, taking some capital gains at zero tax. So uh, again, it's all planning, thinking about what we need to consider for this year as well as next and maybe several years in the future. A special rule allows us to offset some additional capital losses than our capital gains. So the general rule is you take capital gains and offset them with capital losses. And if your losses exceed your gains by $3,000, you can take that. Now, if they exceed, if the losses exceed your gains by $12,000, you're limited to $3,000. Or if you're buried filing separate or single, you get the $1,500 limitation. But again, that's an additional loss that maybe we hadn't considered taking before. So we need to look at our portfolios to see if that's available to us. Another thing when we're looking at our portfolios, a lot of people are investing in mutual funds these days. And we need to consider when it's smart to buy and sell a mutual fund because capital gains are calculated and allocated on some specific dates. And when dividends are paid, <clears throat> also happen on certain dates. So we want to talk to the fund managers, get our brokers to talk to the fund managers to, to give us an indication of where those dates might fall so we don't have an unintended tax consequence where we um, bought in and suddenly had a big uh, tax bill to report. If we would have waited a few days, we may have been more, um, might have been a better idea. Choice of entity. This is another thing that I like to talk to with my business owners. <clears throat> Who should pay the taxes? Should it be a pass through on the individual return? Should we incorporate? What's the difference about an LLC, uh, single member as well as, as multiple member? And what about an S Corp? <clears throat> so there's a whole bunch of things that we need to consider when we're talking about choice of entity. And again, one of the biggest ones is sort of looking to the future. Where are we going to be and what makes the most sense? But you can change your choice of entity even when you first start up and you say, well, I think I'm going to be an LLC. That's great. And maybe that works really well for the first couple of years. But maybe subsequent to that, you find that an S corporation may be more beneficial. So you can always consider it after the initial um, election. There are some um, other, besides choice of entity, we, do we want to file accrual or cash basis? Generally, people think, well, cash basis is always better, but actually in some businesses it may not be. So again, let's think about how the operations are and make a decision based on what is going to be happening. <clears throat> There's a special two and one half month rule related to choosing accrual basis, which allows us to make the accrual as long as we make sure to pay the bill no later than two and a half months after the end of the year. So sometimes that's very beneficial. And then we need to, of course, talk about related party accruals because those are not eligible for deductions. So when should you change? Is it effective for the following year? When does it happen? 
for S corps, we talk about compensation versus distributions and how do we share those and do we have reasonable compensation? So I know sometimes people say, well, yeah, I don't want to pay higher compensation because I want to take more in distributions. Well, it does create higher payroll taxes, but also allows us to make maybe one of those $67,500 401 um, k contributions. So we need to weigh all the factors. We can't just say all tax is bad. We have to figure out what makes the most sense and how we can minimize by picking and choosing. And of course, self-employment tax versus payroll taxes. Are you good at sending in your quarterly estimates or should we put you on a paycheck <laughs> because we need you to do withholding periodically throughout the year? So that's my top 10 tips. I know that was pretty quick. Filing status, dependents, retirement plans, section 179 and bonus depreciation. Are we gonna accelerate income? Are we gonna defer deductions? child labor, maybe gifting assets, capital gains and losses, talking about mutual funds, and my, my favorite choice of entity. So that pretty much wraps up my presentation for today. Let's keep our pro pro ah, profits in our pockets and keep it away from IRS. Anna, did we have any questions? I don't see any right now. And ironically enough, last time we ran out of time, so you never know. So um, don't be shy to ask questions. Uh, feel free. We welcome them. We uh, would love for you to ask some questions that we're here. That's what Kathy is here for. So um, in the meantime, just want to thank you for your participation and attendance. And Kathy, as always, for your expertise, um, please visit our website at nmsbdc.org to view our upcoming no cost webinars or to sign up for no cost counseling services. And then Kathy, did you have another slide or two or did you wanna say any closing remarks? I'm still not seeing any questions on my end. Yeah, and it's funny everyone, last time we had a number of questions and I kind of ran over and so there wasn't enough time. So I tried to talk faster. So <laughs> if there was a point that I was unclear on because I was moving rapidly through it, please let me know. But um, if we go back to our top 10, I personally think some of the most overlooked situations are with filing status. Remember that had a household um, with dependents. Maybe we've got a qualifying relative retirement plans. We've got opportunities to even after the year has ended to perhaps make some contributions. So let's not forget that. And 179, most people know about, they're a little more confused about bonus, but so generally it amounts to the same thing. But yeah, let's look at what's happening on the Washington stage. What are they proposing? And be aware and talk to our industry groups to make sure that we understand if there are some supply side issues that are really impacting our industry for example, I heard this really interesting one about the war in Ukraine. Apparently, Ukraine grows most of the organic feed that's fed to organic chickens in this country. So if you're involved in that chain, you may see, well, and if you purchase from that chain, you're going to see increasing prices because you know what's happening there. I think child labor opportunities exist that aren't being um, fully um, discussed and, and thought out. And again, this all requires some planning. So let's do something before the end of the year and not try to do something after the end of the year. So let's see if there is some duties that our children, even our young children can provide. And so we can start building maybe a retirement fund for them or even helping them save for their college education. And um, we call it um, loss harvesting in our capital gains and loss portfolios. Let's have conversations with our broker to make sure that we can utilize some of the special tax laws to help us maximize those tax deductions. And again, talking to them about our mutual funds so we don't accidentally purchase something at bad timing and create a tax problem for ourselves. 
And number 10, like I said, it's one of my favorites because I find that, again, this is an often overlooked opportunity. I've changed a number of my clients' uh, status, and sometimes <clears throat> we even went with a regular C-Corp in situations where we wanted to maximize employee benefits, and they were the only individual working in the company. And so we could offer all kinds of benefits and um, just really save in taxes. We really, really try to make taxable income zero by the end of the year because there are higher tax rates if you're a personal service corporation and you're organized as a regular corporation. So just be aware of that. Um, so we try to plan to make taxable income zero. So you can imagine we're, we're, we're doing things in November and December to make sure that that happens. But sometimes we switch people to S corps because they are not good at making estimated tax payments and that's easier for them to make sure they're getting taxes paid in during the year. And sometimes we do it for really high earner uh, LLCs because their self-employment tax is just out of sight. And if we do a reasonable compensation study, we can limit their W-2 earnings and push more into distributions, which helps us save payroll tax dollars, which of course those keep increasing every year as well. So I guess those are my additional comments in relationship to those tax tips. And I hope everyone keeps their profits in their pockets. Thank you so much, Kathy. And I do not see that we have any other questions. So again, thank you for your attendance and I will go ahead and wrap this up and we will see you next time.